basic principle be like charges repel unlike charges attract huh? same as man male and female attracts supposed to be male repels <laughs> but nowadays it's no longer true right <laughs> must be male and male attracts female female attracts that is uh it doesn't follow the basic principle that like charges repel and unlike charges attract so separated electrical charges of opposite sign have the potential to do work if allowed to come together this potential is determined by the difference and the amount of charge between the two points a potential difference so there is a potential difference and it's referred to simply as the potential the unit's use is millivolt so yeah supposed to be the positive and the negative attracts and the the force increases as distance of separation between the two charges decreases so there will be more attraction if they are nearer each other and lesser when farther farther apart so movement of electrical charge is called a current electrical potential between charges tend to make them flow producing a current conductors are low resistance materials that facilitate flow of the current whereas insulators they are high resistance materials that reduce the flow that's why with our current electricity you notice that we put insulators okay in it so and water is a good conductor lipid is an insulator so that's why it's dangerous if there is a live wire that for example during typhoon a live wire that drops to the street for example and the street is flooded so there is a danger for you to be electrocuted because water is a good conductor whereas lipid or fat is a good insulator extracellular and intracellular fluid is made up of water and charged ions the cell membrane is mainly lipid in the body therefore we have two low resistance water compartments the intracellular and the extracellular compartments separated by a higher resistance cell membrane remember the is made up of lipids I, in a resting cell a potential difference exists between the extracellular and intracellular fluid compartment with the inside being negatively charged and the outside positively charged as i have shown you earlier more positive sodium three sodium out two potassium in exchange for a free sodium so you have a deficit of positive so you have more negative charge the cell membrane therefore is polarized one end positive and the other end is negative resting membrane potential in the cell it is minus 70 millivolts a typical resting cell has a resting membrane potential of minus 70 millivolts inside relative to 
the outside. Extracellular fluid is assigned a voltage of zero. On the intracellular fluid, the charge in excess of zero with a corresponding sign of positive or negative. The, in, inside the cell, the normal is negative 70 millivolts. That is your resting membrane potential. Two mechanisms responsible for establishing the negative resting membrane potential. One is the electrogenic effect of the sodium potassium adipase, as I have shown you earlier. The movement of potassium out of the cell. Number two is the movement of potassium out of the cell following its electrochemical gradient through the open potassium channels. So this is your diffusion potential. Diffusion potential of potassium out of the cell following its electrochemical gradient through the open potassium channels. You know, because potassium is very leaky, it keeps on going out and going in very unstable. Mag Magulusha. would like to keep on moving. Generation of potential across a membrane by movement of an ion potassium. You have your diffusion potential, right? And you have your equilibrium potential and you have your electrochemical equilibrium. Diffusion potential, this is the potential difference generated across a membrane because of a concentration difference of an ion, a chemical force. Just like I have what I have shown you. Generation of a potential due to diffusion through potas potassium channels. Compartment one, sodium chloride. And this one is potassium chloride, compartment two. Now sodium can go oh, sodium can go to compartment two, but potassium cannot. And so there is a potential, diffusion potential. So it can generate a current, a current. And later the sodium will equilibrate The, in the equilibrium potential, the electrical potential that exactly balances, opposes the tendency for diffusion caused by a concentration difference. Electrochemical equilibrium, the chemical and electrical driving forces that act on an ion are equal and opposite, and no more net diffusion in a course. It uses the Nernst equation. The Nernst equation describes the electrical potential needed to balance a given ionic concentration gradient across a membrane so that the net flux of the ion is zero. It tells us what potential would the ion be at electrochemical equilibrium. For example, 
E equals equilibrium potential for a particular ion in millivolts. Z is the charge on the ion, plus one for sodium, plus two for calcium, minus one for chloride. Because of the valence, remember, one sodium. C1 is intracellular, CI, intracellular concentration of the ion, whereas CO, extracellular concentration of the iron, of the ion. Now, equilib equilibrium potential for a particular ion equals 61. 61 over the charge on the ion times the log of the difference of the extracellular concentration of the outside over the inside. That is your Nernst equation. The, here, the approximate values for equilibrium potentials in nerve and muscle. In sodium, it is plus 60 millivolts. For calcium, since it is plus two, it is 120 millivolts. For potassium, Ninety minus ninety millivolts and chloride minus ninety millivolts. They have the same with potassium. This is the ionic distribution in nerve cell. Forces acting on sodium and potassium ions at the resting membrane potential. Resting membrane potential is minus 70 inside the cell. Both the concentration and electrical gradients favor inward movement of sodium. Because, you know, sodium is a plenty outside. So, lacking, it is negative inside. So, the tendency of sodium is to move in, inside. Okay? Potassium concentration and electrical gradients are in opposite directions. So, potassium will go out and sodium will go in. The concentration gradient. The electrical gradient for potassium are in opposite direction. The greater the permeability and movement of potassium maintains the resting membrane potential at a value near the equilibrium potential for potassium. Because you notice the potassium, it goes out and very leaky. This is your electrical gradient for potassium. This is your sodium potassium ATP phase pump. Establishes concentration gradient and generates a small negative potential. Your sodium potassium ATP phase pump. And then greater net movement of potassium than sodium makes the membrane potential more negative on the inside. Because so potassium is very leaky. It keeps on moving out and move coming in. It's not very st stable. At a steady negative
resting membrane potential. this one because of the leakiness of the potassium the because it is this resting the resting membrane potential of the cell is this the potassium is the one that maintains the resting membrane potential of minus 70 So steps in the establishing of the resting membrane potential. Your potassium, so, uh, sodium potassium ATP span will pump three sodiums out and two potassiums in. So that will generate a negative, small negative potential. So the greater net movement of potassium than sodium makes the membrane potential more negative on the inside, okay? Because more leaky. And then at the steady negative membrane potential, the ion fluxes, the ion fluxes through the channels and the pump will balance. And so the resting membrane potential is established at minus 70 near the resting membrane equilibrium potential of potassium. You have graded potentials and action potentials. Now remember, potassium uh, sodium will get in, right? And potassium will get out. Again, will yeah, but potassium is more leaky. So it keeps on going out, in and out of the cell. So we have graded potentials. These are transient changes in the membrane potential from its resting level that produce electrical signals. There is depolarization and hyperpolarization. When there is there are signal, signals are used by nerves to transmit information. So you have two forms of signals, the graded potentials and the action potentials. Graded potentials used for short distance signaling only, while action potentials are for long distance signaling in nerves and muscles. This is the one that will reach the neuromuscular junction. The, the muscles, will end, will arrive, will reach to the muscles and penetrates deep your action potentials. Your grade potential is not much because they are only for short distance signaling. The, the signal, for example, when the stimulus is already far and the action potential has already traveled, usually the
the, the, the signal that is the, the action potential that is being produced will become smaller. Cell membrane is polarized with the interior negative to the outside. Okay. Now, the polarization makes the membrane potential less negative. Example. From minus 70 to minus 50. This one, you notice this? That is, this one is the resting membrane potential. With depolarization, when there is a stimulus, this negative, this resting membrane potential will become less negative. So this will become around negative 50 only. With the stimulus, because the stimulus is strong, so sodium will come in. And this will produce this wave. We will, we will explain this further. But, but that is the wave of the action potential. It's big. That's why it can reach up to the muscles. So, okay. Depolarization makes the membrane potential less negative because there is a stimulus. Due to flow of positive charge into the cell, your sodium. Hyperpolarization makes membrane potential more negative. Example, from minus 70 to minus 90, okay? Due to flow of positive charge out of the cell. This is your potassium. This is closed. And then when the channel, when the channel opens, potassium will go out. In sodium, this is closed. The stimulus will open the channel. And so sodium will come in then the channel is inactivated. A graded potential, graded potential, a potential change of variable amplitude and duration that is conducted decrementally. This is the magnitude varies. The characteristic of this is the magnitude varies with stimulus intensity. So if you give a strong stimulus, if there is a weak stimulus, then the amplitude is also small. Strong stimulus, strong amplitude. And conducted at short distances. Change in membrane potential decreases as the distance increases. So from the initial side of the potential chains, there is decremental conduction. As the stimulus, as the membrane potential decreases as the distance increases from the initial side of the stimulus. Whereas your action potential
your action potential is this. There is a stimulus. Steady resting membrane potential is near the equi equilibrium potential for potassium. So, resting membrane potential near potassium. And then, this is bigger than the potential for sodium due to its leakiness of the potassium channels. Local membrane is brought to threshold voltage by a depolarizing stimulus. For example, there is a stimulus there. Then the current through opening voltage-gated sodium channels rapidly depolarizes the membrane, causing more sodium channels to open. Thus, the amplitude is greater. So you notice that the action, the inflow of sodium is very fast. That's why the amplitude is big. And with the fast action, there is also inactivation is also fast. So inactivation of sodium channels will take place very fast, okay? And delayed opening of voltage gated channels. So number four, at the peak of the amplitude, there is an activation of sodium channels already. But the opening of the voltage-gated potassium channels halts the membrane depolarization. With the activation of the sodium channels, the opening of the potassium channels gate takes place, but there is a delay. It's not very fast like the sodium. Then, outward current through voltage open gated potassium channels will repolarize the membrane back to a negative potential. Persistent current through slowly closing voltage gated potassium channels hyperpolarizes membrane toward the potassium equilibrium potential. So sodium channels return from inactivated state to closed state without opening. While repolarization takes place, there is a tendency for potassium to hyper to exceed. So it will not stick to the negative 70. There is a tendency to hyper polarize. So it will reach even up to minus 90 because of its slow opening, slow opening of the potassium channels. So there is also slow closure of the voltage gated channels. So there is a tendency to hyper polarize before going back to the negative 70 millivolts. Okay, this is your action potential. Now you notice successive activation and inactivation of sodium channels and delayed activation of potassium channels during action potential. 
will create this pattern. This pattern. Okay, so activation activation gate will open. Activation gate is closed at first, then inactivation gate is open. This is minus resting. And then this, once it is activated, it will open and sodium comes in. So from minus 90 millivolts to positive 35 millivolts because sodium is positive and three. Inactivated, as soon as sodium comes in, it is inactivated. So from, from plus 35 to minus 90 millivolts. Inside the resting membrane potential from nine, minus 90 millivolts, there is slow activation. So there's slow opening of the potassium channel. So from minus 35, uh, plus 35 to minus 90 millivolts. So this is your upstroke. This is your resting membrane potential. Once sodium channel opens, it will flow. There is depolarization. So the upstroke of your action potential wave is your depolarization wave. Then, because sodium is fast, it will get inside the cell fast. So what happens? Sometimes it will overshoot. The downstroke is your repolarization. This is the opening of your rotation channels. And you, since the action is slow, so there is delayed reaction. So the tendency is for it to overshoot from the resting membrane potential. So there is hyper polarizing after potential. So instead of minus 70, it can reach up to minus 90 millivolts. So remember the downstroke of your action potential is your repolarization. The upstroke is depolarization. Now, you notice here in this diagram, the, the action of potassium is fast. And so it easily closes. Whereas that of potassium opening is very slow. So by the time sodium Sodium has ended. By the time sodium has ended, that is also the time when potassium is at its peak of opening. And so since it is very slow, the tendency is it will overshoot. So overshoot the threshold potential. So there is hyperpolarization, hyperpolarizing after potential. Remember that, okay? You think you can get that? You can answer the exam. Now, how is potential propagated. Now remember, it occurs by local currents to adjacent areas of membranes, which are then depolarized to threshold and generate action potential. 
this is the initial site of action potential. And then it will depolarize. So there is opening of the sodium channels. So sodium will come in and produce the upstroke. Okay. Then resting membrane depolarized toward threshold by the local current. Then it will go back to the resting membrane potential. This will produce a positive, right? And then the next, this one. So from there, the, the sodium action will, will terminate and then hyper, there is repolarization. And this will be, this will be repeated at the next, the next uh, part of the, the nerve. And so the positive, this time at first it was here on the, the first part of the nerve. The next positive will be transmitted. Next depolarization will take place again at the next part of the nerve farther. Then repolarization and then there, polar, uh, depolarization again. So that is how the action is transmitted. Because the nerve is covered by myelin, right? Myelin sheath. So there are nodes of Ranvier's here. And so the action potential is propagated through the nodes of Ranvier. So sodium here, instead of passing through There is a myelin here, so it will jump. Thus, the propagation of the action potential is faster. Instead of going through there one by one, it will jump and it will only take place in the nodes of Ranvier where there is no myelination. Thus, the velocity of conduction of action potential is faster. And it's also increased by increasing the size of the fiber. The action, the propagation is increased with the increase in the diameter because there is a decrease in resistance increased by myelination of nerve. Because myelin acts as an insulator, forcing the action potentials to be generated only at the no nodes of Ranvier. So this is called saltatory conduction. This mode uses less sodium potassium ATPase to return the move ions. Thus, this is more economical, the saltatory conduction. refractory periods. There is what they call the absolute refractory period and the relative refractory period. Refractory period, when you say absolute refractory period, this is the period during which another action potential cannot be elicited, no matter how large is the stimulus. If it is 
much larger than the previous stimulus, it doesn't matter. Because during the absolute refractory period, there is no another, there is no other action potential that can be elicited except the existing one. This is due to the inactivation gates being closed during this period. That is the time when sodium is very much, sodium channels is very much open. So sodium will go inside the cell. During the time, that is the time when the wave is up, okay? And then the channels will be closed. So, during this period, no matter how big is your stimulus that you apply another, it will not produce another action potential wave. When you say relative refractory period, it begins at the end of absolute refractory period and continues until the resting membrane potential is restored. So, this is your action potential. And this is your sodium conductance. So, begins at the end of absolute refractory period. This is your end of the absolute refractory period. Continues until the resting potential is restored towards negative 70 millivolts. An action potential can be elicited during this period only if a stronger than threshold stimulus is applied. Potassium conductance is higher than at rest. So the transmembrane potential is closer to potassium equilibrium potential and therefore far from threshold level. Nearer to your potassium equilibrium potential. The action potential in the heart muscle is different. The resting membrane potential is determined by the conductance to potassium and approaches the potassium equilibrium potential. The inward current brings positive charge into the cell and depolarizes the membrane potential. So outward current takes positive charge out of the cell and hyperpolarizes the membrane potential. The role of sodium potassium ATPase is to maintain ionic gradients across cell membrane. Here in the, the heart, after sodium gets inside the cell, Instead of potassium participating right away, there is still calcium. That will replace sodium. So calcium enters. That's why there is a plateau. So there is no repolarization right away. That's why in the heart, there is a continuous, sort of a continuous uh, action potential. Because in the muscle, the sodium flow will end right away, but because of the 
participation of calcium. Now there is a plateau that is being formed before potassium can participate. The ventricles, atria, and Purkinje system have stable resting membrane potentials of about minus 90 millivolts. This value approaches the potassium equilibrium potential. Hmm? It's already 12. What's the problem? <laughs> What's the problem, Sha? <laughs> Here's the clinical correlation. Tetrodotoxin. A neurotoxin found in puffer fish, nebutete, and porcupine fish that blocks diffusion of sodium through the sodium channel, preventing depolarization and propagation of action potentials in nerve cells. Thus, it causes paralysis, especially the respiratory muscles. So, if it causes paralysis of respiratory muscles, respiration is arrested due to this tetrodotoxin. You know, there is a season here in Japan where they eat puffer fish. There is a time, they, there, is, uh, there are persons who are specializing, taking out toxins from puffer fish. But you know, if you eat puffer fish, this is an exotic food for the Japanese. But you know, it's very risky. If you eat puffer fish, but there is a time, there's a season for that around, I forgot, around August when the toxin is um, at the minimum. Toxin and the puffer fish is at its minimum, but still it's very risky to eat puffer fish because of this tetrodotoxin. Lidocaine, the action of lidocaine is anesthetic, right? It blocks the voltages, voltage sensitive sodium channels from thus ab abolishing the action potential. So it causes sensory and motor paralysis and the muscles. So that's why usually lidocaine is for local anesthesia. That's why when you, when you uh, repair, for example, the wound, you have to apply this local anesthesia. So when you suture that, muscle, because of the sensory and motor paralysis. When there is hyperkalemia above normal serum potassium, the skeletal muscles are depolarized by potassium, not sodium. But the action potentials are not produced because inactivation gates on sodium channels are closed by depolarization thus causing muscle weakness. That's why if you have 
uh, sobra, hyper, potassium, you're, there is muscle weakness. And this is very dangerous for the heart. Because you, the muscles in the heart will become weak. And so it cannot pump. You have to eliminate the extra potassium. Another is multiple sclerosis. And it is an autoimmune disease in which the myelin sheaths of the axons and the CNS are attacked by antibodies and cells of the immune system. Loss of myelin increases the leakiness of potassium through voltage-gated channels, causing hyperpolarization and failure of action potential conductance in the neurons. So the symptoms are fatigue, muscle weakness, slurred speech, vision, pain, and other sensory disturbances. But there are patients in spite of multiple sclerosis, they are still working. And hmm? Natayo. Oh. It's about time to have lunch. Uh, this is the neuromuscular junction. This is the synaptic cleft, synaptic vesicles, where the acetylcholine, you begin. Gracia Lebatogas. This is the myelin. So the the and this is the axon terminal. This is the motor nerve fiber. And these are the synaptic vesicles containing the acetylcholine. And this is this sarcolemma, the ending of the nerve is like a, it has pseudopods sort of like that. It will penetrate through the muscles. And acetylcholine, when there is a stimulus, the acetylcholine is being released. Calcium enters the voltage-gated channels and releases the acetylcholine. There is motor neuron action potential. So calcium enters the voltage-gated channels. So acetylcholine is released into the channel. So acetylcholine binding opens ion channels. So there is entry of sodium into the muscle then a local current is produced. With the production of mass local current, muscle fiber action potential, and then back voltage-gated sodium channels then propagated action potential in muscle plasma membrane. Magnesium sulfate inhibits acetylcholine release. So when there is eclampsia in pregnancy, you give magnesium sulfate if so that there will be, for example, there is eclampsia. That means this is abnormal pregnancy, right? So you give magnesium sulfate so that the, the uterus will not keep on contracting. 
So it inhibits acetylcholine release in the muscle of the uterus. So it will not keep on contracting because he, she is not supposed to deliver per vagina. So she has to undergo cesarean section because eclampsia nga so mataas ang BP. She has to undergo cesarean section. Botulinum toxin inhibits acetylcholine release. This is used for wrinkles. And usually in the beauty saloons, they inject botulinum toxins on your wrinkles. And so you will look like uh, wearing a mask. Dentrolin inhibits release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So there is spastic palsy. Tubocurarin and puncuronium. They are a non-depolarizing blockade of nicotinic receptors on the skeletal muscle. So adjunct to anesthesia. Succinylcholine reduces a persistent depolarization blockade of nicotinic receptors, also an adjunct to anesthesia. Yeah, this one, localized paralysis can cause tosis. This is what happened with, who is this? Einstein. With myasthenia gravis, there is generalized muscle paralysis because what happens? In myasthenia gravis, there is no more receptors for acetylcholine. So what happens? Less postsynaptic membrane, fewer sodium channels. So you notice there is fewer, very few acetylcholine receptors, a fewer channels. So what is the result? The muscle cannot contract. So what is manifested first is usually in the eyes, the muscle of the eyes. The eyes cannot open anymore. So you'll have literal to put, put uh, what do you call this, tape so the eyes will open. And later the complication is what do you call this, um, paralysis of the paralysis of the respiratory muscles. And this is the one that is very lethal. So you give neostigmin for myasthenia gravis. But I give stem cell to my patients for myasthenia gravis. Okay, so what else? This one. These are the characteristics of muscle cells. Actually, this is advanced. Skeletal, smooth, and cardiac muscles uh, combined. Compare. No, you try to read on this because next week we will discuss on, I mean, tomorrow we'll discuss on muscle contraction. And you read, try to go over this. This one, this. Neuromuscular transmission. Yeah, so this is part of your handout today so that you read, you go over this and then we will discuss tomorrow, muscular contraction.
we are done. So I will just forward this through the email na lang muna because I do not know how many how to manipulate you know this this way.